I think our class has got bigger. That's good. That's a good sign. Uh, or you've all put on weight. Um, <laughs> excellent. Uh, okay, uh, I put exclamation marks next to some things I just can't forget, so let's do them first. Um, the wiki commentary. Don't forget if you're in Rupert's Tute, you're doing the wiki commentary for this week. Now, <laughs> now, as part of my master plan to make sure the wiki commentaries are really good this semester, I thought I'll get the tutors to write a perfect wiki commentary for week one, and then you will have an exemplar that you can copy and live toward and paste. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, the tutors, I was really excited to see they were all here last week all, and just about all of them were taking notes. And then afterwards, every, after every lecture, there was frantic activity on the wiki as they all, on private hidden pages you can't see, were writing stuff and debating and commenting on each other's stuff. And I was so excited and I wanted to see what it would look like on Friday, but actually it didn't get released on Friday. And then I thought, oh, maybe they're going to keep working on it over the weekend and it'll be late, but that's all right. We'll say to the, the students, you guys can be, have to be on time, but the tutors could have a little bit longer because it was the first week. It took a bit longer. But it didn't come out on Saturday. And then it didn't come out on Sunday. And I checked yesterday and it didn't come out. And I looked just as I was coming in then and it's not up. So <laughs> what the tutors have done is fantastic notes, which are like that close to being finished. And did they benefit you at all over the weekend? No. No. Did they help you when you were revising last week's stuff in order to do the task? No. Would you have liked to have had notes? Yes. Yes. But if we hold out till they're perfect before we publish them, will they ever be published? No. no. <laughs> they will now because a couple of tutors have heard me say it. But the, the, I think the problem was they had no leader. So everyone did something and then they sat around for someone waiting to, for someone to say, it's perfect, we can put them up now. So you guys, in your own shoots, if you're in Rupert's shoots, either you have to nominate someone to be a leader, if you're going to all work secretly and privately and post it as a big surprise at the end, or don't have a leader, work as an anarchy, and post it continuously, and everyone will be able to edit what everyone else is doing, and the leader is just the last person in at any given instant. But please try and put your notes up um, as soon as you can so everyone can benefit from them for the weekend. Um, now, I might have, I might have been, uh, let me just have a check, because I might have, um, they might have got it up while I was talking even. Let's have a look. No. They're the week one notes. Okay. But that's fine. I'm not making fun of the tutors. I'd be the same. But I don't want you guys to be the same. Let's not hope for a perfect thing before we do anything. Let's put incremental versions up as we go and we'll get as close as we can. All right, now here are my um, bullet points from today. Now the first project, so the project, I've sort of mentioned what it was in week one, and over the weekend, I think, um, or at some stage, I've released a draft of the spec so you can see what it looks like. Um, and do subscribe to Stop Press if you haven't subscribed so far, and that way, whenever I make an announcement on Stop Press, uh, you'll get an email. So I did announce that I'd released it, but I noticed that not everyone was subscribed to Stop Press. And I think I've set it up so that you automatically get subscribed by default when you create an account. But if you were really keen and created an account on the wiki really early, you wouldn't have got that wonderful feature. So you might have to manually subscribe. Um, so do subscribe, and that's an easy way of keeping in track with what's going on. So, but the reason I'm saying this is you sort of know a little bit about what the project is. The project is to write the game. Rome. Oh, you do know, you know the whole project. That's right. Because that's really it, and the rest is up to you to work out what features you want and all sorts of other things like that. Now, just making it really clear, I don't want you to plan a perfect game of Roma in your head, write it in private secretly at home, and 10 minutes before the deadline, submit it, and it will be perfect and astound us all, because what do I know will happen? It will take 11 minutes, it will be late, you will get zero, or it will never happen. It will, be, will stay to, at 90% completed, and that's the exciting part, and the last 10% is actually a little bit too much work to do. And it always takes more than 10%, that last 10%. It seems to take another 90%. I don't know why. So I don't want you to do that. I want you to submit the project every week, and the first submission, version 1.1, is due next Monday. So remember, our trick is you just put a few extra features in every time, and you put the most important features in first, the best you can do for the bangs for the buck, and you just keep going. So if you're not yet in a project pair, please encourage your tutor to allocate you to a partner 
and start working and planning and thinking what's going to be in your version 1.1 when it gets submitted on Monday, next Monday, released next Monday. And in the meantime, if you haven't yet done so, you should certainly learn the rules, I would suggest, is a sensible starting spot. Who has yet, who has learnt the rules so far? Well, some people are a bit embarrassed that they've done work. Good on you guys, well done, awesome. Okay, everyone else, please do learn the rules and make sure version 1.1 is due on Monday. And the last thing is the design journal. We want you to keep a journal throughout this course of your thoughts as you go through the course. It could well start with, oh my God, there's something due on Monday. That might be your first thought. But we want you to keep um, a record of your thoughts and reflections about design so at the end of the course you can look back on this thing and it sort of summarizes your whole um, uh, experience as you've moved through the course. Now it's a design journal so we're really interested in design, we're not interested in where you sat or who you spoke to or what people said or jokes that Richard made or anything like that. We're really only interested in things insofar as they impact on design. So thoughts you've had about design, your own designs as you write each task each week, the design tasks, you might learn or encounter, um, you might learn things you might encounter problems, or you might in reflection decide you should have done things differently. That's the best way to improve designs is to think about things you've already done and work out how to do them better. So don't just keep it in your head, write it down. And as an exemplar, I brought along my book, which I have. I think I might have shown you this last year. This wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book my wife gave me is just uh, actually just a nice piece of leather that you can jam any old book into, but it's for my thoughts because I have no memory at all. So this is my short-term memory. And what I do is I just carry this around with me, and if you ever see me in the mornings, I'll just be walking around, looking like this, and occasionally I'll stop and then write something in the book. And all my thoughts are in this book, so were I ever to lose it, it would be terrible. This whole course is in the book, everything. And so it's my journal. And if I ever want to remember what I was doing two weeks ago, not who I spoke to or who I sat next to or what jokes people made or anything like that, but if I want to know what happened two weeks ago, as, as it impacts on my, the things I'm interested in, which is teaching, design, Java, and various things to do with security, then I just go back in this book. And this book is a record of everything. And when this book is fin filled up, I take it out and I put another book in. And I've got journals going back for years with just the year on them, or sometimes I go through two journals a year, and I can go back over my thoughts. And it's really, really useful because um, I think that's the best way we learn, is we learn from our mistakes and our thoughts. And even just writing something down helps me remember it, uh, which is quite weird. So if I didn't write it down, I probably wouldn't remember it. But if I do write it down, somehow that forces it. Maybe it moves to a different part of my brain. And then I don't even have to look at the book because I remember it, because I remember what I wrote down. OK, Whew. they're all the admin stuff. Any questions about admin before we jump into today's lecture? Any questions about anything? Huh? How, do how, do you, how do you submit the project? Oh, there's a link on your home page. There's a link for each version of the project. Oh, let me go to your homepage. Is there anything secret on your homepage, or can I go to it? No. No, no. Um, uh, uh, now I'm trying to remember. It's Shogun something, something, something with D, isn't it? Shogun. Uh, A-N. I think we might find it now. Here we are. So here's your homepage. Um, Here's version one. You will put a link in here that when I click on it, it will take me to a page that are your release notes for version 1.1. Okay. And you will attach your code as a jar file to that page. Oh. Yeah. And we'll talk about jar files this week. But I'm expecting your first version um, is going to have very limited functionality. <laughs> Yes, it has to work. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like when people release Firefox version 1.2, Firefox version 1.21. Every version has to work, has to run against all your unit tests so far and has to work, but every version slowly adds extra features. So you can't just like start setting up your classes. No, that's right. That's a really good point. I've forgotten your name. Joe. Joe. Joe, I didn't remember that was your name, but it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, you can't, I don't want you doing all this infrastructure stuff. That's the last thing we want. We don't want you doing what people do when they see a big project if they're in industry sometimes and they think, oh, we've got to write a new insurance system. Let's spend nine weeks doing data flow diagrams and then three months doing uh, data analysis and then two years doing a prototype and then four years have gone by before anyone actually starts writing any real code and by then the project's collapsed or something. No, we want something working in the first week and then working and working and working. And the idea, I should, we will talk more about XP on Thursday, but the idea is 
you do the simplest thing that can possibly work. So don't try and think ahead and plan ahead. You do plan ahead because you think about all the features you want and you make a plan as to what's a sensible ordering on them and then you start doing them in that order. That's your planning ahead. But you don't, while you're doing, think, I'll just set this up now, this will help me later. No, no, no. You do the very simplest thing you need to make it work and then when later you need extra functionality, you rip apart your code and you change it. And that's called refactoring. And we'll talk a lot about how to do refactoring. And of course, we're all scared of refactoring, so we try and anticipate as many problems as possible so we never have to refactor. But then our code turns into a big, ugly mess before we even get anything working. So uh, this is a whole new way of thinking for you, for you guys, which will be, write the simplest thing you can do which, which works. And if there's something that never gets called, don't implement that function. Yeah, yeah. Don't think, oh, I'll need this one day. And then, yeah, so that's the plan, that's the plan. So yeah, make a link here, check the ACLs are right and that no one else can read it and all that sort of stuff. Also, Shogun, just looking at your page, there's all these little eyes here. These eyes are information that your tutor will tell you. As they tell you this information and you fill it in, just remove the eyyes. So I don't want to see eyes on anyone's homepage eventually. So you have put in your correct email. Is that your real email address? Uh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and <laughs> you picked that yourself? No. No? That doesn't make any sense, that's crazy. Okay, uh, and then this is correct, this is correct, this is correct, that's correct. That's not the name of your group? So I think you, a light bulb next to it means you get to have some input here. So you type in your group name, you and your partner agree, and then kill the light bulb. Kill all these eyes because you've already filled that in. Are you really reporting in red weeks? No idea, I'll leave that eye there and your tutor will tell you and when they do, it's either gonna be red or black and fill it in. Down here, Bill Badger, is he your project partner? <laughs> I suspect not. Okay, so when you find your project partner, so when's your tutor? Who's your tutor? Jared, is he here? All right, so you won't know till Thursday who it is. So you, between now and Thursday, just read the rules and know the game and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, and your design partners? These aren't your design partners either. But you must know your first design partner because you and they put together your first it was just you? Yeah. You did it solo? Yeah. Okay, well then say no, say it was solo or something. Just fill it in so we know it's filled in, so we know what's happening. Okay, cool, and here's your task. Yeah, this is perfect, what you did here is perfect. So just do this, here. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Uh, any more questions? That was a good one. Do, 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 do. And so our weekly ritual is gonna be, on Friday we hand in our design task, on Monday we hand in the project. On Friday we hand in the design task, on Monday we hand in the project. On Friday we hand in the design task, on Monday we hand in the project. But, but sh 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 don't think that means you have 24 pieces of assessment. You've just got one project, we're just making you do a bit of work on it every week. We don't want you to do any extra work, we actually just want you to do a bit of it on it every week. We're not expecting 100 hours worth of work, we're expecting, well it's in the budget, I think five hours work each week. So, and we, want you, we don't believe that, it, and you presumably don't believe that if we left you to your own devices and said, guys, it's a 60 hour project, do 60 hours worth of work, hand it in on this date, no one in this room presumably believes you'll really do 60 hours work and hand it in on that date. You might do less than 60 hours work and hand it in on that date, or you might panic towards the end, not having done anything, and do 600 hours work but it'll all be panic, last minute, stressful work and it won't be as good as 60 hours of work spread over the whole course. So we really actually just want you to do that. So we only expect the program to get slightly better each time. And we don't expect a big jump in the last week, we're just slightly better and better, yeah. Um, we're expecting us to pair program for the whole... We're expecting you to pair for everything in the course except the final exam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that, but no, no, that's a serious question, I'm not joking. I mean, I would quite like you to pair program in the final exam, but I have to have some sort of invigilation to make sure that someone's not covering for you. What about like remote pair programming? I'd prefer you to do it together. Obviously, you're not always gonna be able to do it, but our intent is that it will all be pair program. We don't want it being split into separate jobs and done separately. Um, you'll be tempted to do that because that's your current approach to programming, but we, the reason we want you to encounter pair programming is pair programming is used in industry and it is very successful. It's probably the successful technique being used at the moment. So when you guys go out, I want you to be able to pair program. If you go out as a solo hero, no one wants solo heroes anymore. 
Well, maybe Google does if you're working on some solo hero project. But most places <laughs> doing interesting stuff want you to be able to pair program. So I want you to learn those skills. So you're doing it for you. You're not doing it for me. I, I'm not going to actually be able to check how closely to see if you really do it. So you'll be able to get away and not do it. And you'll probably be able to go and Google code on the internet and copy code. You know, there's all these things you could do to sort of hand in an assignment at the end but not actually do all the things we want you to do. But the, as I said in the last course, the reason we want you to do all those things we want you to do isn't because we want you to do them. It's because we want you to go through the transformations that happen to you once you do them. And the only way to learn pair programming is to do it. And you will fight it with every fiber of your being because it's so alien to everything you've done up until now. And you have to just go through the pain and do the thing and experience it and then start to see it working. Now, Rupert, who's sitting at the back, um, you guys did, you actually did pair programming in a course last year, didn't you? Was that the first time you've done it? You did it for a whole course. And how did you find it? It's like 40 hours a week of pair programming. 40 hours a week of pair programming. That's AOS. <laughs> it's a very hard course. What's that? It was really good. It was glorious. It was really good. Yeah. Basically, when you start doing it, you don't want to do it because you want to do everything solo. But when you get in the vibe and it's working and you and your partner start clicking, the quality of the code you produce and the pace you move at is like nothing you've ever seen. It's like you're skiing. You know that first time you go skiing and you're going, whoa! It's just like that. You know, there's no friction. You're going so fast. It's beautiful. We want you to learn that. You can circumnavigate it and do all, circumvent it and do all sorts of other things <laughs> and circumnavigate it if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's for you. You know, you've got to take control of your own learning, really. That was a good question, so thank you. Any more questions? We can. <laughs> yes, that is a fantastic question. And the answer to that, R2D2, is. Uh, <laughs> no, no, any more? Because these questions are good. If you've got questions like this, really, we're, we're spending our time very well. No more? Okay. All right, let's just talk about Java really quickly. Oh, I hate starting off with a history of something, but it's sort of, it's sort of interesting and it gives you the context of Java. You know, the reason I want to tell you about the history of Java is twofold. I hate history. Okay, we're not going to examine you on the history of anything. There's not going to be any questions about dates or anything like that in the exam. But there's two interesting things about the history of Java. One is the way it arose led to some really interesting design decisions being made about the language itself. And I want to talk about that. That's really interesting. And the other thing is, it's very confusingly named. And I want you just to understand the name so you don't start freaking out. Because it's had the corporate world intersect with it. So there's a million acronyms associated with Java. And if you go and try and download it and you see all the different options you've got to download, your, your brain could very well explode. And I don't want that happening because it's messy and hard to clean up. So here's the history. World's super fastest history of Java. A guy called James Gosling. Worked at Sun. Oh, I, don't, I could even be getting all this wrong. Maybe he wasn't at Sun at the time. Um, he was at Sun? He was. That's what Wiki says. That's what Wiki says. <laughs> yeah, that was me. That was me. I put it in there. Um, <laughs> James Gosling was working on this project. And the project was this. He wanted to write programs to run on embedded systems because everyone saw the way of the future was internet-enabled fridges and things like that. That although the most expensive and obvious computers in the world are these fancy things you've got on your laps, the most common computers in the world are the things in your washing machine and in your car and in your burger alarm and in the air conditioner and in that data projector and not in this crappy projector. <laughs> And you know, the, the little things, the things that are the thing, the driver that's controlling this LCD, the little microchips everywhere, uh, that's most of the computer chips in the world. Now, it's really tricky to program them because you've got to know a lot about each specific microchip to program it. And the, the languages and the support for these microchips tend to be pretty crappy. So you're not writing, you haven't got this beautiful programming suite available to you when you're programming some random chip. You, you just got what you get. You're lucky if you get a debugger or an assembler. You'll get an assembler. You're lucky if you get a debugger. And you certainly don't get fantastic software development tools. So he had this idea that he was writing code or he was in charge of a project where they'd be writing code so Sun could write stuff and run programs on little microcontrollers and microchips. And he thought, oh, man, this is just such a pain. Every time you get a new microchip, you've got to learn the whole microchip from scratch. And then the microchip changes. You've got to learn all this new stuff. And I just want to write programs. I don't want to learn to think about microchips. So he had this idea, which was, well, wouldn't it be neat if every microchip 
I, I write programs not for a microchips, but for an imaginary machine, like an imaginary friend. His imaginary machine was called the JVM. He said, I wish I had a JVM. The JVM is this cool microprocessor. It's a cool computer, a cool operating system. I wish I could write programs for the JVM because it's so easy to program the JVM. So he just pretended the JVM existed. And he wrote out all the details of how the JVM would behave. And then he wrote this really nice language, Java, which generates code that runs on the JVM. The byte code, the machine code it generates, runs on the JVM. That's step one. And then step two is he wrote an emulator on every chip ever invented. It took him a couple of weekends. That made that chip look like what? The JVM. Now, can you see that this is a brilliant idea? What it means is, he didn't really write this, other people did. As soon as someone invents a new chip, all they've got to do is write a JVM emulator for that chip. And then any Java program in the whole universe can run on that chip. So if you write a Java program, and you compile it and get Java bytecode, and I've got that bytecode, I can run that bytecode on every microprocessor in the universe. And that was the big problem with C at that time. C was an amazingly powerful language. It let you do all these amazingly powerful things, but you had to rewrite everything every time you had a new chip. That's called porting it. So you'd port all your software to a new chip or a new operating system or a new set of libraries. Or when anything under the language changed, you had to port everything. You had to rewrite your programs. In a C program, everything changed. As you move from chip to chip, the size of int might change and the way it did this might change and the way arithmetic worked might change. And everything sort of changed. So it was this real nightmare Reconfiguring. So when you go and download Firefox, you go to the download page to download Firefox, you know a little menu pops up and it says, are you running it on the Mac version 10? Are you running on the Mac version 9 on a PowerPC? Are you running it on an IBM uh, 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 compatible machine running Windows? Are you running it on a Linux machine? You've got like four or five different ones you can download. They had to port Firefox to four or five different chips operating system setups, underlying setups to work on. And Firefox won't run on your fridge. Because <laughs> no one ever ported it to your fridge. And they probably ported it to the iPhone. So maybe, have they ported it to the iPhone? Does it run on the iPhone? No. Okay. So um, what, uh, people had to do a lot of work to do that. And for every program you want to run on all those machines, you'd have to do that same amount of work to port every program. And his brilliant idea is, we only have to port one program now, which is a JVM. And the experts of the chips can do that, and then the people writing Firefox just have to think about Firefox. So I remember the first time I downloaded Tomcat, which is a sort of a server that runs um, Java sort of server-side stuff. And I went to the Tomcat download page, and, it, and it's writ Tomcat itself is written in Java, and I, there's just a button saying download. And I'm going, oh, hang on, no, I'm running this on a Solaris machine. And I'm looking around, where's the pull-down menu? I'm sure this is just the Windows version. How can I find the Solaris version? And I was like hunting all over the site for enough while I thought, it's Java. <laughs> it runs on everything. So the whole idea of Java was write once, run everywhere. Now, I didn't exactly get it right. You still have to do a bit of porting and fiddling and diddling. But it's this brilliant idea. And it moves the burden of work from your application programmer to your systems, your systems programmer. It's very clever. Done once, done brilliantly, done perfectly by a system programmer. Application programmer doesn't have to think about it. So that was his brilliant idea number one. Brilliant idea number two. Oh, and who likes this idea that if I wrote a game, say, I wrote Pong, this incredible game I just invented, who likes the idea that my Pong program could run on a Mac and it could run on Windows and it could run on Linux and it could run on your iPhone and it could run on your fridge and it can run on your Wii? Who likes the idea that you could get that Pong program and you could run it on everything? Yeah, 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 yeah. Who doesn't like that idea? Microsoft. Microsoft. <laughs> Why don't Microsoft like that idea? They have to compete. Why do they have to compete? Uh, because they have to Yeah, uh, even more insidious than that, once you start going down the Microsoft path, you're locked in. You've bought a lot of programs. You've spent a lot of money on your programs. You've developed your software. Your companies developed your software. Your bank has developed their software to run on Microsoft Windows. They can't just suddenly say, oh, actually, we want to use Linux. 
because they'd have to rewrite everything because they've got this crappy code that would all have to be ported. But suppose your bank had written everything in Java and then the new version of Windows comes out, what is Windows 3.1 comes out, <laughs> and Bill Gates wants to charge you, or Steve Ballmer wants to charge you $5 million for each copy. And suddenly you think, but hang on, I can download Debian or uh, Ubuntu and it's free. And you start thinking, well, we've got 10,000 terminals in the bank at $5,000 each, 10,000 times 5,000, 10,000 times zero. <laughs> and you start thinking about it, you think, oh, we want to move to Ubuntu. If everything was written in Java, you'd go, okay, here's how we do it. Windows machine, check out, check out. Oh, no, you don't check the machine. No. <laughs> Pick that up. Windows delete. Ubuntu CD, boot Ubuntu, old program still run, now we're on Ubuntu. There's no lock-in, you're not locked into Windows, so Microsoft hate it. So they did all these things to try and attack Java initially, to try and make Java fail. And that's the other interesting part of Java history. Uh, should we talk about that? Yes. It is a little bit interesting. Um, <laughs> The first time I saw Microsoft do this, actually, was with um, the internet. Now, Microsoft initially weren't very um, pro the internet. And I remember years and years ago, I used to work for Microsoft uh, while I was doing my PhD and as a researcher. And we wanted to get internet access. And we couldn't. <laughs> they didn't have internet access. So we said, well, we really need it. And they're going, what's this internet? Why do you want to be connected to the internet? We've got NetBuoy running on a Microsoft LAN. Isn't that good enough? No, we want to be on the internet. So they said, eventually, someone gave us access. So we had to dial into Redmond over a modem line. And then we got access to the Microsoft firewall machine. And we had accounts on that machine. And then we could jump straight out. I'm sure those accounts don't work these days. Um, but you know, essentially, the internet wasn't a big thing. So lots of other companies like Netscape and uh, oh, and, and, and so on, developed lots of stuff. And eventually Microsoft thought, whoa, hang on, the internet's taking off, we'd better jump in. But by then there were already serious competitors in the internet um, uh, uh, industry, particularly different browsers. And Microsoft was very, very keen to grab the browser market. So you know what they did? It's a famous story. Bundled they bundled it. Well, they bundled it, that's right, so there was all that antitrust stuff. But what did they do to stop people being able to switch to other browsers? Blink oh, the Blink tag, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it wasn't just Blink. In fact, I'm pretty sure Netscape supported Blink. We make fun of Blink. Blink is a terrible, 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 terrible tag that you should never put in your HTML. Only, it was only Netscape that supported it. was only Netscape that supported it. Oh, they didn't support it. Uh, I'm okay. So um, here's what they did. And we know this because of documents revealed in the court cases. I mean, we all suspected it at the time. Uh, what Microsoft did was they, um, they used a strategy called embrace, extend, extinguish, <laughs> which is they say, we love the internet. The internet's great. We love web pages. Web pages are great. We love browsing. Browsing's great. We love HTML. HTML's great. We love it. <laughs> and then they say, we love it so much, we've written our own browser, Microsoft Internet Explorer. You get it free with Windows. What's more, we like HTML so much, we've added some extra things to it. Extra tags and things, like all this extra cool stuff that makes HTML, the language that the internet uses, the web you know, uses to render pages, that makes it very much more expressive and you can do these amazing things. And so they ignored the HTML standard and they did their own stuff. They supported the HTML standard, but they also allowed you to write extra stuff on your web pages. Which meant, Does anyone need to to read them? if someone writes a web page using these Microsoft wonderful features, the only people that can view that page are people using Internet Explorer. So you started seeing web pages had this abomination on them. Best viewed in Microsoft Explorer, Internet Explorer, or best viewed in this. The whole idea of the web is it should be interoperable. It should be write one HTML page. It runs everywhere. Everyone can write, everyone can share. It's all about open and sharing and connecting, not about having little closed separate networks so people on the Mac internet can't talk to people on the Windows internet, can't talk to people on the Linux internet. It's better if they can all talk to each other. So, by extending the standard, it sort of destroys the standard and forces everyone to uh, adopt their particular instance of it, and then that extinguishes the standard. So embrace it. Uh, look, uh, we do the same with mosquitoes. Uh, I don't know if you've ever, like, if you're in a country where there's lots of malaria and it's uh, born by mosquitoes, one very clever way of attacking it is uh, that's how all sorts of things were tried to try and knock out mozzies. But the best one was this. Do you know? Deet. What's that? Deet. No, 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 no. You irradiate a whole lot of male mosquitoes. Or oh, no, female mosquitoes. I can't remember which. 
females. Irradiate a whole lot of them to make them sterile. Then you release them. Because mosquitoes love sex. <laughs> it's fantastic. And one consequence of having sex is baby mosquitoes. But the idea is you release all these... You think it's female? I don't know. Anyway, one of them. You release them, they all still have sex, but no babies happen. Does that make sense? <laughs> so you release... Suppose you release really alluring female mosquitoes. And all the male mosquitoes put all their energy into impregnating these alluring but sterile mosquitoes. And they use up all their precious bodily fluids. <laughs> or maybe it goes the other way. I can't quite remember now. It's a very clever idea, but I have to think about it to understand. But it's the same sort of idea, which is... Um... <laughs> I won't say it. Okay. Uh, so the same thing sort of happened with Java. We had this Java standard. Sun, uh, so Gosling, uh, working with Sun, proposed Java and made it open for everyone to use. Not open source, but open for everyone to use. And it was exciting. People started writing programs, and you could write a program once, and in theory, anyway, run it everywhere <gasps> to Microsoft. So, um, and, and let's not make fun of Microsoft. It's, it's quite natural what they did, and there's not bad or evil. That's their job. They're a company. They have to make money. That's their job. They would have been bad to do anything else other than to try and destroy the internet and then to try and destroy Java. That was, that's their imperative. So there's no moral value associated with this, but it's unfortunate for the world that it happened. So they uh, tried. To, so what did they do? They got their own. They, they had Java. They licensed Java from Sun. They, um, they put Java on all their machines. Everyone had Java on all their machines because it could do really funky and amazing things. And then what do you think they did? They started changing it. Extra stuff in Microsoft Java. But Sun uh, actually countersued, I think, is the story. Does anyone know the details here? Sun mounted an, argue, uh, an attack on them saying that they shouldn't do this because they'd licensed it, they weren't allowed to change it. And then, um, and then uh, Microsoft got huffy and took Mac off machines. And it didn't work anyway. So the standard is there and it runs everywhere and it's this really clever idea. It almost runs everywhere. It's sort of moving in the right direction. So that's what's neat about it. One is that it runs on the internet. You can run, um, uh, a sub, uh, you can run Java. Uh, I can write a Java program which knows how to talk to a web page. And I can put it on my server. And when you fetch a page, it can fetch this Java code as well, and the code can run on the client side. And we didn't have any client side stuff happening for a while, so that was incredibly exciting. And that was called an applet. But, so everyone was excited by applets, and that's part of the prevalence of Java. Applets, though, um, were a bit heavyweight to write. So a lot of people used a derivative of Java called JavaScript to run stuff client side then. But um, anyway, because of the popularity of the web and Java was the web language, that was really exciting. So that's one uh, neat thing about it. The VM model, the uh, VM stands for virtual machine, their notion of having the JVM, the Java virtual machine, that's a very clever idea. Java also had OO, and it did it in a different way to the way C++ did it. C++ said, here's C, and OO ideas are really good, so let's just add them onto C. Much the same way as there was a beautiful old language called Ada that had every idea from every language ever invented all jammed into it. And it was a perfect language, but it was so big and cumbersome, it was very hard to write programs in it. I mean, you had to know a lot to be able to use it. Well, C++ was like, here's C, and then let's just add all the OO stuff, so now you can do OO, and you can do C. But you're not compelled to do OO, and you can do a crazy mix of the two, and it's yeah, a bit of a mess. Not a lot of people like C++, but Java was OO to the core. It didn't quite get it perfect, but it was pretty close. It had this neat idea called garbage collection. As you know, another problem with C programs, Gosling was writing with C in mind. He was thinking, if I could start from scratch, if I didn't have to worry about backwards compatibility and making people happy and all sorts of things like that, and I could just design the perfect language, what would I want in that language? And he wrote out his wish list. And this is why I think um, it's interesting because it was a designed language. It's a bit like Canberra. Gosling also designed Canberra. <laughs> <Thought. laughs> uh, Canberra being a, a design city rather than an accidental one. So um, Java. The idea with garbage collection was, uh, he thought, the, one of the annoying things about C is memory leaks. And it's very hard to stop memory leaks happening in C. And when you write code with even the best of intentions, you could easily introduce a memory leak. It's very hard to spot it, and it's very hard to catch it, especially if the object being created is temporarily in time and physically, in terms of code space difference, far removed from the area that eventually disposes of the thing. It's very hard to make sure that each malloc is exactly matched with one free. It's very, very hard to do. Uh, well, Java solved that problem in a sort of sideways. He said, well, let's not make that the programmer's problem. Let's make reusing memory and getting rid of dead memory that we don't need anymore. Let's make that a problem of the JVM. 
It has to hunt down this unused memory and it frees it up automatically. Another programmer doesn't have to think about it at all. And there is no free in Java. That was a very clever idea. And the JDK has now been open source. The development kit we used to write Java um, is now open source. That used to be a negative against Java because it used to still be a proprietary language owned by Sun, who we thought was a fairly nice company, but we were always worried what would happen. You know, they have control, what's going to happen. But now the whole Java thing's been open source. The whole JDK has been open sourced. Um, uh, that's good. It's sort of not controlled by any one corporation anymore which was very lucky because, as you know, very recently, or as you probably know, some was gobbled up by Oracle. And whew, we're all going, oh, thank heavens, it got open source before Oracle got there. Because who knows what would happen. OK, what's not neat about Java? I won't talk about that now. Let's come back to that later on. But I can give you, you might think about some things as you're writing programs in Java. One thing that's not neat about Java, I reckon, um, is it can become a bit of a mess. Because every time someone thinks, here's a good idea we should have in Java, the Java guys go, oh yeah, let's put it in, it's a great idea, man. And so this really beautiful, nicely designed, small, tight language that was not completely expressive and didn't have every feature known to mankind in it, but had all the ones that we thought was really impressive, now has a whole lot of kitchen sinks in it. And the language itself is quite big. Uh, and that can sometimes be a bit um, frustrating. OK, let's just go quickly through the name so you know the notation. Uh, there's different versions of Java. The first one that came out was Java 1.0, and that's the one we all programmed and liked, and it was, it was really impressive, but it had problems. And then Java 1.1 came out, and a lot of things changed, which was really annoying, especially if you'd been writing GUI stuff, suddenly everything was different, but we all relearned it and learned Java 1.1 and had to port everything from one version of Java to the next, and we thought, what happened to this write once stuff? And then Java 1.2 came out, and more things changed. And now, at this point, the marketing people at Sun had this brilliant idea, Java 1.2, let's call it Java 2. <laughs> brilliant. So it's called, Java 1.2 is called Java 2, even though it's 1.2, and you go version, it says 1. So if you see people talking about, so in other words, they didn't get rid of one name and switch to the other, they kept both. So it's 1.2 and 2. And uh, at that point, it sort of forked as well, and they had a standard edition, the JSE, the Enterprise Edition, the JEE, -E, and the, at some point, probably happened a little bit later actually, the Micro Edition, JME. We are only caring about the JSE. The JEE -E is something I think you probably have to pay money for it. Does anyone know? And it's very complicated and got a whole lot of extra stuff we don't need. JSE, the Standard Edition, is exactly what we need. So if you download it, get the JSE, not the JEE. -E. Now, after version 1.2, version 2, version 2 of the JSE, it's now called, JSE version 2, started being very confusing. Then version 1.3 came out, which was still known as Java 2. <laughs> so it was 1.3 of Java 2, I guess. And then 1.4 came out of Java 2. And then 1.5 came out, which they called Java 5. And then Java 6 came out, which is 1.6, which is what we're using. So we're using Java 6, 1.6. Uh, and we're using the JSE. Um, the runtime environment, uh, so the J, uh, blah, 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 the, let's just jump down a little bit. The JDK, the Java Development Kit, is a series of tools you need to write a Java program. Because as you started to notice with OO programming, I bet, there's lots and lots of files that you have to manage. And you could do it all with a WordPad and um, a command line compiler, but there started being so many different files and it started all, everything started getting spread out a fair bit that it's really nice to have tools to help manage the whole thing. So the JDK, is a collect, the Java Development Kit, when you download it, uh, is a collection of tools that let you write programs. If you just want to run programs, so you just need the JVM essentially, and the libraries, you need the virtual machine yeah, and the libraries, then you get the JRE, which is a Java runtime environment. But we need the JDK, which is actually, in modern terminology, an SDK, a software development kit. So normally when you, someone writes something new and gives you a whole lot of programs to do stuff that help you write it, it's called a software development kit. But in Java, it's called the JDK, and I believe they have an SDK as well as a JDK. Does anyone know about this? And the SDK contains a whole lot of extra stuff that you don't need. So if you want to ah, the SDK is the JDK JDK. Yeah. <laughs> JDK DK. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, Liam just said the JD SDK, the SDK is what you need for writing the JDK. <laughs> Can it be true? Lots of acronyms. Thank heavens they've all got three letters in or we'd get confused. 
So we've done all that, done all that. Um, sun, uh, oh, Oracle took over Sun, which I quite like. I've mentioned the word Apollo because the, as you know, the Roman Greek, or as you may or may not know, the Roman and Greek god of um, truth and art and beauty and all those really cool things is also the god of the sun. And uh, all the early people uh, around the sort of like ancient prehistory time used to worship the sun. And Apollo is the sun god. Uh, so that's fantastic. But he's also the god of the Delphi Oracle. And the Greeks loved the Oracle. And they went to the Oracle when they had any question. If you've seen the movie 300, have you seen that movie? There's a long climb up the top where he has to ask the oracle a question. The oracle was this crazy old woman who'd sit over a gas vent where noxious fumes would come up and destroy her brain and she'd babble incoherently. And that was the basis of their government. So um, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. In fact, you know, uh, just on a completely unrelated thing, that the, um, I, when the, um, the Persians were coming across to do the massive invasion and wipe out all of Greece, and the Athenians heard they were coming, and they quickly sent messages to all the other city-states, come and help us, the Persians are coming to crush our whole country. Um, the Spartans, who were the awesome warrior people, sent back a message saying, oh my god, that sounds terrible, we'll be there soon. We just have to wait till after the full moon. <laughs> because, you know, the oracle said we can't fight while well, there's a full moon. <laughs> Thank you, crazy old lady. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Um, so Apollo is sort of the god of both. So it's sort of nice that they merge. And I, the, um, the famous environment, the most popular environment to write Java code is something called Eclipse. And we're, I'll, I'll be using it today. And I sort of like that I do because like Eclipse is something that obscures the sun. So I wonder if there's some sort of weird naming thing going on here. I don't know. So we'll use Eclipse today. Eclipse is um, what we call an IDE, another um, three-letter uh, acronym, which means integrate, stands for in, uh, Integrated Development Environment. Integrated means everything's all together. So inside one window, I can just click on buttons and it opens files for me and shuts them and recompiles everything. And when there's an error, it moves the mouse to the right spot. So I don't have to think very much. All right. Whew, that took a very long time. That took way too long. All right. Um, I'm going to draw a little picture and then we're going to start coding. But was it interesting? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it was. Oh, they wanted to compete with NetBean. Eclipse. They did want to eclipse them. They wanted to obscure the sun. That's fantastic. Well, their product should have been called Moon or something. <laughs> if they were going to eclipse. Muttering to myself. Here we go. All right, here's just a quick, uh, the quick uh, shot of the picture we looked at yesterday, just to get everything in context. C. Let's do the land of C first. We've got static. This is compile time stuff, and we've got dynamic. And in C, we have a whole lot of functions. Here are the functions in source code. And when they execute, there's this sort of weird, crazy execution path of execution where one statement's executed by another by functions calling each other at runtime. Statically, we've got the program, and then we trace some sort of trace through the programs at runtime. And we also have um, type defs. Uh, and in fact, let's be precise. Let's say our square blocks here are just our ADTs. Let's not worry about other type defs. So we've got ADTs, which are type defs. They're structs, pointers to structs. At runtime, suppose I've got a stack ADT. At runtime, I'm going to instantiate it. I'm going to say malloc size of stack. And I'm going to assign it to some pointer. And I'm going to get some area of memory. And that's going to be a stack. That might be stack one. And I might malloc again. And I might get stack two. I might malloc again. I might get stack three. And they're all coming from stack. So we've got three areas of memory associated with one sort of static thing. And last of all, the other way we have data in our programs is not by mallocking it, but where else do we have data in our programs? What? On the stack, yeah, which is where? Like, where, where is it things, how do we get things stored on the stack? What's our mechanism for using the stack to store stuff? Rather than just using random bits of memory, if we want to store variables on the stack, how do we do that? What's that? Yeah, local variables. So we might have some little local type def in here. And when that gets executed, down here, say, then lo and behold, little area of memory set up on the stack. And if that gets executed again, suppose it's a recursive function or something, another area would get set above it, and another would get set above it. And then as the function exits, that area gets reclaimed 
and reclaimed and reclaimed. So this is a dynamic behaviour, this is a static behaviour. This lives in files, this lives in memory. Now, so you see, um, the language C reclaims memory really nicely as long as it's local parameter memory, as long as it's stored on the stack. The only thing that's a problem where we get our memory leaks is where we malloc stuff, where we do it on the heap. Okay, that's C. And the Java equivalent is Well, let's look at C. Well, 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 actually, let's talk a little bit more about C before we see the Java one. We want to do this encapsulation thing. You know, that's our one trick that we saw last semester. Our most impressive software design trick is the notion of information hiding, encapsulation. So we wanted to make sure that not everything could see everything, because otherwise it turned into a big mess that was unmanageable and error prone. So how did we make our ADTs, how do we encapsulate our data for our ADTs? What we do is we split our ADT definition, actually we split it into two parts. Now I'm going to use a dotted line or a little faint circly line to indicate file boundaries. So we might have these functions here and this data type defined in one file. And that would be say called stack.c. And we split this part off and defined it in another file stack.h. And maybe this function's in a file with that function and this function. Okay. And now in C, in the land of C, what files things are in isn't really so important. A file isn't really a first class citizen in C. At compile time, all the files get, um, a whole lot of things get hash included and everything gets sort of combined together. And then the thing gets compiled into object code at a file level, but then they all get linked together into one big mush. And during the linking, no one really remembers where anything came from. And certainly during the hash including, no one remembers where anything came from. So you could break the files this way or that way or this way into files. You could break the functions into files in lots of different ways. And comp after compiling, it makes no difference. Because they're all mushed together. But we saw a little trick. We saw um, two little tricks, actually. One trick was to hide our functions. So we wanted to encapsulate our functions so other people couldn't see our functions. So I could write a private function and you, who are somewhere else, miles away, can't see it. And remember the reason I don't like him seeing the function is... Why, it's abstraction and why do I want to abstract it away? Why don't I, why don't I want to hide that function? Yes, can I rephrase that? And yes, can I rephrase that? Which is, if he, or who had the function? You had it? Yeah, you've got the function. He wants to hide it because if someone miles away, if you could see his function, the terrible thing is you might use it. And if you're using his function and he doesn't know about it, and he now is the person that wrote the file that this is in, and you're another programmer somewhere on the other side of the world, you're using his function, then if he changes his function, but he changes all his other functions at the same time and the net effect is everything still works. But you're relying on his function not changing, suddenly your code breaks. So it gives us this brittleness that we don't like. Whereas if we hide things away and we know that no one in the world except you can see the functions that you wrote in your file, then you are free to change them as much as you want and you won't break anything. So we like hiding functions. So how do we hide functions in C? Uh, no, no, the functions we hid were our local, our hidden functions, our inner functions. Someone said it? Static. Yeah, we said static. We called the function static. Static in front of the function name in C simply means this function is a static function. It's something that's around at compile time. And that was a little trick, but it's a very clever trick and it works. It tells C, make that function available while we're compiling this file. But don't bother creating any external linkages to it. So when we get to link time, no one else can link into it or use it. Only the things in that file can see it. So it's one of the rare ways that files became important in C. The file boundary is important. Once we say a function is static, it only lives in that compilation unit. No one else from outside that compilation unit can see it. So that abstracted functions for us. That hid the function, encapsulated the function. How do we hide the data? I want to, for the same reason, be able to hide the internal representation of my data because if I tell you how I represent my data, he might use it. 
And once you start using it, relying on me representing it in a particular way, oh, I'm putting the, um, the serial number first and the book title second, once you start writing code which extracts it and assuming one's first and one's second, I can't change my data or rearrange it or do anything because I will break anyone that uses it. So I also want to encapsulate my data, which was abstract data types. And how we did it in C was, well, again, we split it into two files. We said our abstract types were just a pointer to a struct. We told the world that they're a pointer to a struct in the .h file, which we export, which the whole world can see and other people can hash include it and get it. But the details of the struct were in this file, the .c file. And that meant no one else would know the details. We like, it's like, um, I wish I could remember the story. There's some sort of story called Shazam or something like that, that somehow a brother and sister got separated or something, and just before they were separated, they broke a coin in half somehow and made necklaces out of it and wore them in that critical moment. And then when they grew up, these two, they met each other and these two parts, when joined together, do you, do you, am I making this up? I seem to remember it's a cartoon show. <laughs> it's a good idea if I'm making it up. I'm going to paint it straight away. Um, so the idea being, this is exactly how we store the secret of our data. We get our type that we want to keep secret, and we split it into two. And we let the world see one part, which is all they need to see. They just need to know it's a pointer so they can pass it around and do things with it. But I don't tell them what it's pointing to. And the only people that know what's pointing to is this file. And as long as no one else hash includes this file, no one else knows it. And of course, no one else ever hash includes a .c file, do they? They just hash include the .h files. So it sort of gives me protection. Again, it's a vaguely sort of lame protection because someone could just rewrite this in their own file and if they knew what the definition was and they could get it. But OK, so that's sort of how we do it in C. Does that make sense? That's encapsulation in C. Now let's look at Java. So C sort of supports it. We can use C language features to sort of trick it into getting encapsulation. But Java is designed to be encapsulation city from the ground up. So let's now look at Java. Static land, our source code. Well, everything in Java lives in something called a class. I've drawn this before, but I'm just drawing it again because you'll need it when we do the source code in a sec. And inside every class, a class can contain data, oh, <laughs> can contain functions, and it can contain data fields. And here, I'm just, this ADT here contains a whole lot of fields. Okay, so these are those fields. I've separated them out here. Yeah, four fields. And they all belong to a class. And the file makes, normally the file boundaries in Java are, are sort of sense, uh, are meaningful. A class also corresponds to a file. Every class, one class, one file. You, you can violate that a little, but let's not. So that's our static picture. And this class might be called the stack class. It has functions in it, and it has uh, data fields in it. And then at runtime, if someone goes new stack, it makes a new one of these. It's like doing a malloc. So dynamically, you get an area of memory set aside, and you get a runtime version of it. This is called a class. This is called an object. You get the functions. And you get the data. And if I did, and that might be called S1. And then if I did new stack again, I'd get another one of them. Okay. And this is S2, another object. Now here's how we get the encapsulation thing working in Java. If you want to call a function that belongs to an object, and now hopefully all our functions are going to belong to objects, then you say object name dot function. So if you want to call the pop function of S1, you go S1 dot pop. And if this is the pop function, then that calls this pop function. And if you want to talk about a data field in here, suppose this is called, I don't know, serial number. And you want to know the serial number of S1, how do you refer to that? S1 dot serial number. Functions have brackets. Data doesn't have brackets. OK, so now everything's going to belong to an object. And when we refer to it, we give the object's name, dot, and then uh, what we want. Either it's a, a function, 
a method, we call them, or it's a piece of data or an attribute or a field. Now, the nice thing about Java is that it's got encapsulation built in. So when you define the functions and the data inside your class, at that exact instant where you're defining them, when you're writing the program, you can actually specify whether you want them abstracted or not. So if you want the world to be able to see them, what do you call them? Public. You say public void pop. Oop, public. And you'd say public void push. Uh, actually, pop isn't void, is it? And you'd say uh, public void is empty. No, public boolean is empty. That means the world can see them. And your inner functions, the functions you don't want anyone to be able to see, so you're free to change them as much as you want, what do you call them? Private, private, private. So in front of every function name now, you either say public or private. Now Java has actually four security classes, four different security attributes, properties, levels, whatever you call them. It's got public, it's got private, it's got another crazy one called protected, so you could say protected instead of public or private, and it's got another crazy one called default, which is what happens if you don't write anything. But in this course, and certainly in the first couple of weeks, we're all just going to write public or private, okay? And we'll look at the other ones later on. They'll pop up. Um, uh, and the field, if I want everyone to be able to see the field, what do I say? Do I, I say int serial number? No way. What do I say? Public int serial number when I declare it. I'm not declaring it inside the function. This is when I declare it inside the class. And, I, and if I want a field to be hidden, I'd say private int height. Because we love abstraction, what are we normally going to make our fields? Private. We're normally going to want people to access the fields through the functions. So we're normally going to have our inter well, what, uh, sort of, if we go back to the land of ADTs, we'll make our interface functions public, we'll make our internal inner functions private, we'll make our data all private, and the only way you can access it is through the public function. Is everyone cool? That's our standard approach. Does that all make complete sense? All right. Now, we're going to do some coding straight after the break, but I did want to show you a picture before we go to the break, so let me just show you that. Do, 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 do. I want to go to the why is design hard problem. Um, because design is hard. In this course, we're going to be really interested in what makes a good design, question one. What makes a bad design, question two. That's a qualitative thing. It's really hard to work it out. You sort of know it when you see it, but that's not good enough, is it? Because we want to be able to do them, not just recognize them. And actually, you don't even always know it when you see it. I remember a story about the um, Opera House. Do you know the one, the Utzon story? Utzon, the great designer that came out. Uh, 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 he was, uh, oh no, 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 how did it work? There was a competition to design the best, most awesome Opera House for Sydney. And everyone, including kids, could submit drawings of what they thought the Opera House should look like. And the judges sat in a room and they, they winnowed it down and winnowed it down and winnowed it down. And eventually they got it to the three, what they thought were the three most awesome designs. And they got uh, Utzon. Uh, no, not, they didn't get Utzon. They got someone else, some other brilliant guy who I wish I could remember his name because he's going to be the hero of this story. And he came in and he said, here I am, an architect from another country to help you pick the winner of your competition, exposition. And they said, thank you, architect from another country whose name Richie can't remember. Here are the three finalists. Can you tell us the best? And he looked at the first one and said, ah, ha, ha. And then he looked at the next one and said, hmm, ha, ha. And then he looked at the third one and said, hmm, ha, ha. Ah, ah. And then he started wandering around. And he wandered around. And he wandered off. <laughs> and he... And he ran triumphantly back inside with the bin. And he started going through the bin, looking at all the ones they'd thrown out. And eventually, he said, this, this scribbly piece of paper from a child in Denmark, or whatever country Utzon's from, this is the best design. So he didn't just accept the designs that they'd put forward, because they were actually not very interesting. He wanted something more fantastic. So he picked Utzon's design, which is the design we got with. And everyone hated it. And the public hated it, and everyone always grumbled that we had to pay for it and build it. But now we've got it, we sort of secretly all love it, because the Opera House is pretty cool. OK, so design is hard. And sometimes you don't even know if a design's good or bad. When you look at it, you've got to think. You've got to have an open mind and an open heart, and you've got to be able to see the potential of what's there. Now, we engineers, 
So we want to make stuff and we want it to work and we want reliability. We can't have some wishy-washy qualitative thing. At the end, we've got to have something that works. So we better come up with some principles that are going to help us find good and bad designs. And it's hard to do design. So I just want you to think about this question. Why is design so hard? And I have a, at least a partial answer that I've thought of, but it's only a partial answer, which is best illustrated by Sterrance. So let's just make this. What? <laughs> ah. Hang on. Oh, no, 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 no. Stop. Because now we've got crap ad and we have no volume. We'll get it. Don't worry. We'll find it. Serence, this is strong bad. Strong bad doing design. He's about to do a design of his very own. Are you ready? Oh, no, I'm turning on the wrong microphone. But we clearly have some microphone there, don't we? Okay, here we go. What would you like as if you were your own made up animal? Sincerely, Spud Jr. Calm down, Spud Jr. Why would Spud Sr. think of such nightmarish grammar and punctuation? And poor Spud Mom, what would you like as if? I at least hope you're good at sports for their sake. All right, I'm done. Well, Stupid Jr., if I was my own made up animal, I'd probably like as the coolest made up animal I've ever made up. I would have all the cool animal options and accessories claws, horns, tusks, tentacles, power doors, baskets, pigmented eyes. I say that, <laughs> Do you know the times? <laughs> so, I guess I couldn't really talk with that proboscis. Not that I'd have much of an answer for do you know the times, anyway. Maybe I could be one of those deep sea finding fishes. You know, the kind that have Christmas lights all over them and those custom viewers hanging over their heads. Right this way, everyone. Three puppies, ginger snap, pocket PCs. Except I also have an awesome back deck on me for dinner and dancing. Hey, that baby child, do you want to watch it? That's a lot of weights. Turn it out, strong guy. Turn it out. Oh, wait. How can I enjoy the dinner and dancing if I'm already the fangly fish? <laughs> Maybe I'm overthinking this. I should just come up with a cool name and the rest will like as itself. I would be called the Hud. <laughs> the Hud. <laughs> yeah, no, no Hud. Oh, wow. Look at the Hud. Um, how about the Red Steckled Albermont? No, no, no. Um, the Barnack. What the? Why did he keep coming out as nasty blob things? Okay, okay, okay. Got a little good for the lappy. My made up animal would be called. Sterrance. Hey, get it! Look at Sterrance. Oh, Sterrance. I want one. Sterrance is way cuter than that stupid, ugly old washed up that Gia used to have. <laughs> Okay, so that's pretty awesome. So the idea is he could do anything he wanted. He had his own imagination. He wasn't even going to have to build this thing. He could imagine any creature he wanted. There was no limits. He could design the perfect animal to be. And all his designs were ugly, blobby things. And this is our problem. When we try and design something, even if we have no constraints and the sky's the limit, at the end, we're going to be fighting this temptation to make an ugly blobby thing. And the thing I like about this is, at the end, he produces Sterrance. It has none of the attributes or qualities he really liked, if you go back to his original list. It's not scary or anything. It's pretty pathetic. Okay, so uh, let's take a break. We'll resume in five, ten minutes.